pray for us before we get too far down this road. And I'm going to totally rip off one of my favorite pastors the way he prays. All right, you ready? Everybody heads. Dear God, fill us, speak to us. Amen. Amen. He prays like that. But hey, sounds about like you need, right? Hey, so if we haven't met yet, and I tried to meet as many of you as you came in the doors as I could, my name is Justin. I get the privilege of being the student director here. Yeah, yeah. Students, like every Wednesday, I hang out with y'all. Y'all put up with me. I get it. It's a cool relationship, all right? Um, so if you're new here, welcome. We're glad you're here. We believe this place is family. We also believe that we are a movement kind of reaching out to our community to help spread the light of the gospel and of Jesus, and it's been yeah. incredible to watch. So tonight, we're actually concluding our series, Pursuing Purity. Pretty sure I heard like a collective sigh of relief. Um, and then if you're like, I'm so curious about what y'all talked about, those are on the YouTube. You can go back and watch those. So tonight, we're wrapping it up, our series on relationships. And tonight, we are talking about this thing called guardrails. Some of you might be familiar with guardrails because you drive over Buford Dam. Anybody drive over Buford Dam? Like you have some reason to go over to Cumming for any reason? No? Perfect. All right, Cumming is this faraway land where things are still backwards. Yeah, there you go. Um, we have a few Cumming people in here. <laughs> so guardrails are these metal things, kind of like a fence, that they put them along the side of edges of roads. That way you don't fall off the road into a ditch. I will admit <clears throat> that I was driving a church 15 passenger minibus to camp. Uh, the way it took us was across the dam. I don't know why. We were going to Snowbird that year. And as we're hitting Buford Dam, if you don't know, it is a really narrow road. It gets a little tight. And uh, to make sure I didn't hit oncoming traffic, I was kind of hugging the right side. We went through a turn. All I heard was, <sighs> yeah, that was a real awkward moment. I don't think the church knows, but <clears throat> I mean, I was like 20, all right? Give me a break. 15 passenger vans are kind of, well, the vans are cool. The buses are kind of terrifying. Those like Ford E350s or whatever they are. So guardrails, they're the things to keep us in place. So we don't stray too far off the road. And so when we're talking about guardrails in the context of relationships, not just like romantic relationships. Yo, guardrails are important for your friendships, sometimes just good for your own like personal health. Playing three hours of Xbox is just not useful to you for two <laughs> Because like, but I love it! You know, he's like, he said it. So, and, and part of this is also because it helps us honor God with the way that we treat others and treat ourselves. And listen, there's some of you in here, I get it. You're like, I'm not bought into the God thing. You're kind of weird. I show up because my friends are here. I'm forced to listen to you. It's a great snooze fest. I get it. I'm trapping. Here's the thing, though. I think in your relationships, you still want to be loved, be honored, and be cared for. And I think you also would admit that somewhere inside of you, in your relationship with other people, you want to honor them, you want to love them, and you want to care for them. You want to feel safe with other people. And so the guardrails and the principles we're going to talk about tonight can be useful in a lot of different situations, even if you're like, I don't really subscribe to the whole Jesus thing. That's okay. We're glad you're here, and we're glad that you're exploring it. Now, we are going to go to Scripture to study these principles. And so to get started, we're going to examine one of the most important characters in Scripture. And that's this guy named David. Who's heard of King David? Anybody King David? Okay, cool. So essentially, if you go back to what we call the Old Testament, there's a king named David. He's the second king in the line of kings in Israel. And he's the one that like, God specifically chose. Like David is so hyped up, they're like, he's the guy after God's own heart. Now let me tell you right now, can we stop putting Bible characters and pastors and ministry leaders on a pedestal? Because what we're going to study tonight is not one of David's triumphs. We're actually going to study one of David's failures. Because here's the thing, the only person in this book and who's walked this planet that any of us should be lifting the name on high of is Jesus. He's the only one that's perfect. David failed, and I like that. Because it means that when I fail, I know there's redemption and hope and mercy for me too. So we're going to study one of David's, actually one of his great failures. So if you've got a Bible with you, and if you don't, it's going to be on the screens. We are in 2 uh, Samuel chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Here we go. In the spring, when kings march out to war, that's important to know. Anybody in here history nerds? Oh, good, I got a couple of y'all. All right. So 
This is specific to ancient world. You see, ancient world wasn't as cool as our military. They can go at like all times of day. And if it's like frozen outside, they're like, that's cool. I got like Patagonias and I can just suit up and whatever. So in the ancient world, you had to fight when the ground was dry and when it was warm outside. Because if it was cold outside, you freeze to death. And if the ground's muddy because of all the armor and stuff that you're wearing and carrying, you actually sink in the mud. And then furthermore, you got to take care of your families back home. And the only good, you know, you have to do that during the winter time, keep them warm, keep them alive, make sure the farm survives the winter, and then you can leave them and go to war. So that's why they make this, like, hey, in spring, where it was common that all these ancient kingdoms, and all they ever did was fight, nothing's new underneath the sun, this is when they go to war. Let's keep going. So David sent Joab. <clears throat> Problem here. Kings usually go with their armies. Anybody ever heard the story of 300? The Spartans? That's right. All right, cool. So Sp basically, ancient Greek city named Sparta gets invaded by Persia. We glorified it. Zack Snyder made a movie about it. Here's the thing, though. King Leonidas was with his Spartans. King Xerxes, with, now he's at the back of the line, but he was with the army of Persians. So kings go to war. So when David should have went, David sent somebody instead. He sent Joab with his officers and all of Israel. Not literally, like all the dudes, all right, all the guys in the army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. So what did David do? He stayed home. He didn't go where he was supposed to go. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. He stayed home. In a time when kings go to war, David stayed put. So first examination, first thing I want to ask you, and it's more of a, uh, not like a literal question, but like figurative. Are you where you're supposed to be? In your relationships, in your friendships, in, in the way you spend your free time, are you where you're supposed to be? And this looks different for everybody. We all know the places that we probably should not be. We all know the places that we, we should not go. Right? So are you where you're supposed to be? So let's keep track with David here. Verse 2. One evening, David got up from his bed and strolled around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. Some of y'all laughing because you're like, how'd they get a tub up there? I don't know, all right? Ancient cranes. Uh, typically operated by blind people. Random history nerds, okay? Um, that's what you get. I'm a nerd. So David gets bored with his Netflix bin. Like, he's watching Vikings Valhalla, he's binging it all, he gets done, he's like, man, I'm bored, you know what? I'm gonna go stroll on my rooftop. Because, of course, his palace has access to his rooftop. And then, of course, because it's the biggest building in the entire land, because it's his palace, you know, it overlooks the entire kingdom. And then just conveniently, right there from view, is this lady's house! Like, there's, there's temptation for David right there. Now, was what the woman, who we will come to learn as her name is Bathsheba, was what she was doing wrong? I don't know. All the men are supposed to be at war. All the men are supposed to be at war. Why is the tub on the roof? I don't know. Aesthetics, maybe. I guess that's just kind of cool. Maybe there was some ancient world science that I haven't studied where it's like, well, at a certain temperature of day, if you get on the roof, it gets heated. See, now we got water heaters, so I can just turn on the hot water even when it's like 9 degrees outside, and miraculously, without a pipe bursting, my water will still get lukewarm. Right? But back then they didn't have that option. So maybe, maybe that's what was going on. But there she is, and guess who's looking? David. And remember, he's not where he's supposed to be. He ain't supposed to be at home binging Netflix. He's supposed to be at war, not couch potatoing and peeping around his kingdom. So let me ask you this. In the kingdom of your life, in the realm of your life, in the area of your life that you have control and purview over, are you at war, actively? Are you fighting against the things that are trying to encroach upon you and to drag you down or to cause confusion? Or are you kind of just couch potatoing in your life? You're kind of like, ah, if it comes, it comes, I don't really care. I let, I, you know, I watch whatever. Are you unguarded? Remember, I've talked for the last two weeks, there's an enemy who comes to spill, kill, and destroy. He's coming after you. He's opposed to you. So are you living guarded? Are you watching over your kingdom, over your life? Or are you living unguarded? Verse 3. 
So David sent someone to inquire about her. That means to ask questions. He wants to know more. They didn't have Facebook, so he couldn't just like Facebook stalk and like, all right, so and so lives at these GPS coordinates, right? Couldn't do that. The servant comes back and he says, "This is him talking to David." He goes, "Ah, uh, isn't this Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam and wife of Uriah the Hethite?" I think I pronounced that correctly. If you don't pronounce that better, tell me, okay? And Uriah is actually one of David's close friends. Like, this is one of his, like, top captains. The dude's actually at war right now. So let me tell you this. What you desire, you will pursue. What you desire, what you set your eyes on and go, ooh, I want that, you will run after. So David sends someone to, sends someone to ask about her. He's toying with his own curiosity. He should have just been like, oh, whoops, wow, and then turned back inside, right? He should have left it entirely alone. He should have also been like, I need to go to war. I've been at home for way too long. I'm getting a little restless on my, on my rooftop, you know? I wonder if he was doing kind of like the edge game, you know? It's like, oh, I'm drop the penny, you know, see what happens when it hits the bottom. Now notice the servant that he sent to inquire comes back and he runs up a red flag. He's like, hey, boss! Isn't she, like, married? Right? And it's like, to one of your captains? Like, hello? Is anybody home? Should have been in war. Had opportunities to join the war effort. He's got a servant now giving him the red flag. Listen, in your lives, in our lives, in my life, there are always opportunities to stop and turn around. Hopefully you have somebody like this servant in your circle where when you start making decisions you know, to, to go to a party or hang out with a friend group, they're like, hey, remember the last time you did that? And you came back and you were like hurting? And you were like broken? And you were all in your feels for a while? And not like the good kind of feels, but like the really unhealthy kind of feels? Hopefully you got somebody like that in your life who's running up those opportunities to garden. Verse 4, verse 4 through 5. So David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to him, he slept with her. Now she had just been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Afterward, she returned home. The woman conceived, and David sent word to inform, or he, and then somebody sent word. She sent word to inform David, I am pregnant. So David ignores the warnings, and he just runs right into sin. Just plunges right into it. And the way the rest of this plays out, so he ends up in an attempt to cover up his sin, because your sin will always take you further than you wanted to go, and it's going to hurt you more than you thought it would, and it hurts others around you. He ends up murdering her husband, one of his friends. Y'all are like, I never read the Bible before. What? Yo, there's so much stuff in here. Go to read Second Kings when like a prophet of God calls out two she bears. All right, that's a real thing. It's wild. So you're like, that's in there? I'm serious. Read your Bibles. All right. So he ends up murdering her husband to cover it all up. And then, and then God sends a prophet, Nathan, because he's like, dude, man. And Nathan comes, and he's like, David, you got to repent, man. You got to, like, you, you got to turn this thing around. So real quickly, to wrap up some of, some of David's story here, I want you to turn to Matthew, if you got your Bible, Matthew 1. And uh, here's what I want to I wanna share. So last week, we talked through a really, really heavy, really hard conversation. And um, I think some of y'all... Unfortunately, I did you a disservice. Some of you walked away with there was confusion or, or I don't know. You walked away some hard feelings. Because some of you, you're like, I feel like David. This is my story. I, I did something outside of God's design, outside of God's plan, and I don't know where to go from now, from here. What happens next? Can I still be used? First, let me tell you that if we did that by human standards, I should not be on this stage. That I've done things outside of God's design, that I've looked at stuff I should not have looked at in my past. It's part of my story. And because God is a good God who loves his kids, there is redemption and there's reconciliation. So I want to show you, because by all accounts, we look at David and we go, bro, lightning strike, you screwed up, smite button, right? Like if we played God. We just started all over. Watch this. Matthew 1, verse 1. This is an account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Remember, that's the one name that if there's any name you're lifting up on high, it's his name. Because he's perfect, he did for you what you could not do for yourself. The son of David. Now, that's not like his daddy's name. This was the way they kind of referenced genealogy, they kind of picked some important people. This is the King David, the son of Abraham. Now, check it, jump, jump down to verse 6. David fathered Solomon by Uriah's wife. That's Bathsheba. 
David and Bathsheba's stories were redeemed. Both of them. They're redeemed. They're part of Jesus' genealogy and story. Friend, no matter what you've done, your story can be redeemed. Our stories have the possibility for redemption. What does it look like several chapters down the road? Whose life will you impact because of your story? Because you say, you know what, God, my way kind of stinks. I keep trying it my way and stuff just keeps happening. I'm broken. But if I turn it over to you and I place faith in you because you did for me what I could not do for myself on that cross, man, what's the story that he can write for your kids and your grandkids or even just the friends in your community? David and Bathsheba were redeemed. Were those of us who we were in charge? That's like a big fat L. And God says, uh-uh, I don't, I'm not in the L business. I don't condemn people. I don't shame people. I'm in the restoration and repentance business and redemption business. I provide hope and healing and peace. That can be your story. So I just want to put that out there for those of you who are like, whoa, last week was a lot. There is redemption. There is hope. But that choice solely rests with you. All right. So back to 2 Samuel. There's four implications to help set up your guardrails. The thing with guardrails is they're all personal to you. What works for me in my life to keep me kind of safe and on the road might be different than you, all right? You might be like, I totally can text and drive. Please don't, don't text and drive, okay? All right, that was the thing, and people finally shut that down. But in your lives, four implications. Number one, situational awareness. Situational awareness. Be aware of where you are. You know the areas where you are more led into danger or not. Situational awareness is like a military term. It's keep your head on a swivel at all times. If there is an enemy out there who's opposed to you, be watching for his attacks to come. If you've got friends who are constantly poking and trying to drag you down, be aware that that's coming so you can be like, nah, fam, we ain't talking right now. Put a pin in it. Situational awareness. You know where you are most likely tempted to look at things you shouldn't look at, hang out with friends you shouldn't be hanging out with, go places you shouldn't go. Be aware. Keep your head on a swivel. And if these are struggle points and you know what yours are, the easiest fix here, change the situation. Some friends are better off as acquaintances. It's just the reality of the matter. All right, number two, because we got to keep going here. Run from what you can't fight. Listen, if this is a situation where you're like, you're trying to white knuckle it. I don't know what it is, but you're trying to white knuckle it. You're like, I just, I can do it. I can man up this time, a woman up this time. I can, I can hold through. I can do it. And you keep falling, and you know that you keep falling, run from it. Flee from it. Some things we just aren't meant to fight. That's one of those change situation moments. Run away from it. Take some stuff out of your life that should not be in there. David knew that being on his rooftop was not where he was supposed to be. Because let's be honest, how many times have you probably been up there? And how many times have you probably noticed there was some kind of like rose gold tub hanging out on top of somebody else's roof? And he was just hoping. He saw what he should not have seen, and he knew where he should have been. Run. Number three, have bold accountability. Bold accountability. Or as we like to call it, have an accountability buddy. All right? And a, I know. Say it with me. An account? Abilla? Buddy. There you go. It's like an accountability partner, but it's kind of more friendly. So an accountability buddy. All right? And it's also fun to say really, really fast. This is somebody who, like that servant, is going to speak truth to you in love. They're going to they're gonna ask you hard questions in love. Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron, and so one person sharpens another. This idea is what leads to you being fully known. So my wife knows me really, really well. Like probably ninety eight percent, and she'll always. The thing with her is she'll always get to know me. Like that's a constant, like weird thing with marriage. You just keep learning about each other. It's weird, all right. But I do have a friend. Um, some of you all got a chance to meet him. He was here on January first when I got the when we were over there uh, that Sunday. Um, and then he actually he reads every time I write one of these and send it. He reads it, gives back feedback. Every time we post one of these, he watches it, gives back feedback. And it's not like the, yeah, it was so good, bro, Holy Spirit. Blah, blah. No, no, he's like, yeah, that sucked. He's like, dude, like you could have done it. Now, it's not always that mean. But he is that legit where he's like, hey, you could have said it this way. Think about it in this context. Furthermore, because of my personal life, he knows all my red flags before I know my red flags. Like he fully knows me. He knows like my trigger points. He knows the reasons behind those trigger points. He knows me. He's my accountability partner. And everything short of his own sin 
is he is like a Jesus here on this earth in front of me. He is such representative because he tells me hard things, but not in this judgmental, like negative, condescending way. It's more like, dude, you're loved by God. Let's, let's do this together. How can I walk with you? Your accountability partner, accountability buddy, should be walking with you, not just telling you all the things you should do better. That's just legalism. That's just religion. That's just Pharisees. Have bold accountability. In fact, with that friend, when I started dating my now wife, I told him straight up, I said, dude, I have a tendency in relationships to do this. I focus way too much on her, and I put her on a pedestal. I said, if that happens, and I stop hanging out with you, you get my attention. And he's like, oh, I got you. Thankfully, it didn't have to happen as much. But there were times where he was like, hey, man, you, you're losing it. You ain't worshiping the right person. So, bold accountability. Number four, healthy thinking. Healthy thinking. What you put into your mind is what you will dwell on and will come out through your actions. Romans 12, 2, which I thought was funny that Reed read that because I don't think he knew that I had this in here. But it says, do not be conformed to this age. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. We are not supposed to look like world or culture. I'm not talking about your drip. All right? Some of y'all got fantastic drip. I don't. Help brother out, right? I'd like some J's. I'm just going to be real selfish about that. I think they look cool. Okay? Um, but more so, it's the way you act. It's the way you talk. It's the way you love on one another in your school. It's the way you help sharpen one another and lift each other up and elevate instead of just roasting people down. You wonder why there aren't more students in here? Because it's potentially that they look at you and they actually don't see anything different. So they go, why should I even bother hearing about Jesus? Nothing's different about you. When I roast somebody, you roast somebody. We're supposed to look different. We're supposed to call to act and live and look different. And it starts with what goes in our minds. As the old saying goes, garbage in, garbage out. Philippians 4 8 says this, this can help with your thinking. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. This is a great list, and I've done this personally, to write on your mirror, to write on a note card, to screenshot it on the YouVersion Bible app and have it as your phone background, and then start finding things in your life that match this list. Find things in Scripture that match this list. Speak these things over yourself. Speak these things over your friends. And watch how the healthy thinking that goes in then changes, and you begin to see healthy things come out of you. So, based on these four implications, here's a few things to help you kind of set some guardrails in your relationships with each other, and even for yourself in some areas. Number one, maintain clear situational expectations. When you go to hang out with a friend, set an expectation. Hey, I'm going to be home by 9 o'clock. You better get me there. Mama knows. She's tracking me because she's crazy. All right? Clear situational expectations. Number two, be honest with others and invite them to be honest with you. It's a two-way street. Number three, run from what you cannot fight. Number four, practice healthy thinking. Number five, practice forgiveness of others and ultimately yourself. Forgive yourself. You're going to run into one of your guardrails. I run into my guardrails. And while it might leave a scrape on the side of a minibus, hitting a guardrail and resetting it is way better than me ending up in the ditch fully broken. Forgive yourself when it happens. Pick yourself up, brush yourself off, and go, that's why the guardrail's there. It helps keep us safe. It helps keep others safe. And keep moving forward. So in small groups, I want you to focus on, on, on two things in your conversations tonight, as openly, as comfortably as, as you feel. Number one, accountability. You are a community. Hold each other to a higher standard than what culture tries to tell you. And number two, establish clear guardrails. Again, those are specific to everybody. My guardrails aren't necessarily your guardrails, but establish clear guardrails. Set lots of them. Specific guardrails may vary, so explore some options in group. Spit some ideas out there and kind of ping them off the wall. And then make them known to your accountability buddies. Because that helps them look out for you. Because they can be like, hey, you're, 
you're leaning a little bit too far to that guardrail on you for damn man what's going on over there they can help you so i'm gonna pray and then you guys are free to go to small groups if you're new here tonight don't know where to go please just come to me after and i can get you there oh. dear god thank you so much for tonight thank you for your word thank you for your truth thank you for your love thank you for your grace and thank you for the gospel thank you that only you can provide for us what we cannot provide for ourselves I pray that these students tonight would have healthy conversations. I pray that their, their friendships and relationships and even the way they manage their own time would just see a drastic increase because they began setting some clear expectations and guardrails of how they manage themselves around others. God, I pray that you just be glorified in all things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we love you. Be free. Right.